Election Day is Tuesday, November 6th, and CMU Public Broadcasting again brings you Meet the Candidates, the election year series that gives you the chance to meet those seeking state and national office. Support of WCMU is provided by Flint Institute of Arts, presenting Drawing Together International Cartoons. The exhibition features 300 cartoons from the Iden Doan Foundation International Competition and runs through December 30th. FlintArts.org. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas. We are joined this time by Representative Kevin Cotter. He is a Republican from Michigan's 99th uh, State House District, seeking re-election to that office for a second term. Representative, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. As our program title uh, entails or, or leads to a chance in our first couple of moments for, for you as an incumbent to sort of uh, re-meet uh, those that are uh, going to be making the votes and uh, tell us a little bit about your background, the experience that you bring to this campaign. Sure. I was uh, born and raised here in the area. Uh, I have lived nearly all my life in the district. Uh, born and raised here in Mount Pleasant. I uh, went to school in Shepherd, just south of Mount Pleasant. Uh, later graduated from CMU uh, and then later attended law school in Lansing. Uh, I've been a licensed attorney for the last five years. I have a practice in downtown Mount Pleasant and uh, first ran for office in 2010 and over the last nearly two years have been serving as state representative. I uh, have had some amazing challenges and uh, uh, really enjoyed the experience and uh, feel that we've moved the needle. Still have a long way to go and I uh, look forward to talking about that more. The district itself with the 2010 census and the redrawn maps uh, give us a sense of District 99 different now than the area that you first campaigned for, sort of draw us a little bit of that uh, mental map of the district, if you would. Sure, due to redistricting, the district does change some. Uh, we have uh, remains all of Isabella County, so that remains whole, uh, but in Midland County, uh, the old district is 12 townships of Midland. Uh, that changes. We'll lose four of the more populated townships and pick up two others uh, that are more rural. And so that was needed uh, to make up for some population adjustments. We had over the last 10 years about 11 percent population growth in Isabella County and as a result had to uh, adjust that population. So it remains all of Isabella County and 10 townships in Midland County. For District 99, for the state as a whole, as one seeking re-election to an office, what do you identify as the primary issues of the campaign? Well, there are some major issues remaining. Uh, certainly the economy and jobs, that has been a, uh, an issue from uh, the current session that will carry over into the next. Um, another issue that is hanging out there uh, that I'm looking forward to taking up this fall is road funding. We've had a, a serious situation uh, with our roads and the way that we fund those roads. Um, it's, it's gotten to the point now that the, the formula that we use, it's based on a gasoline tax, which is a flat 19 cents per gallon. And so as the cost of materials go up, as the cost of labor goes up, that 19 cents remains constant. And so this formula is broken. Uh, we have to reevaluate that. And I'm uh, looking forward to uh, getting that opportunity this fall uh, to, to get some money back into our roads because we're losing valuable um, the value of our investment. Uh, but certainly the, the focus remains on jobs and the economy. What can we do to make Michigan a better place uh, to attract jobs? And, and really, you know, continuing that realization that it's not government that creates jobs, but we can create the environment that will help foster future job growth. As one seeking re-election, then we always ask the incumbents to, to look to uh, his or her record legislatively then as a primary sponsor or supporter of bills that came about during uh, this term that is winding down. What did you do to address uh, those primary issues that you've identified? Well, there have been several, uh, several examples. I would point probably the biggest and the uh, most overreaching would be my work on the Appropriations Committee. I was uh, chosen to be on the Appropriations Committee, which is charged with our state budget. And so we started off in January 2011 with a deficit of about a billion and a half dollars. And certainly there were many adjustments made in 2011 to get that budget to balance. And some of those de decisions were very difficult. Uh, we had to um, make some cuts in some, some areas, uh, increase spending in other areas, but it was trying to put the state back on a path uh, so that we could move forward. And uh, when we came back in January of 2012 to start that budget process again, we actually came back to a surplus. And so that was really um, a good feeling, a feeling that you know, some of the tough decisions that were made in 2011 paid off because it was nearly a $2 billion swing. You go from a billion and a half dollar deficit to about a $500 million surplus. So I would say that work on the Appropriations Committee has been my, um, the work that I'm most proud of. When it comes to the issue of the road funding that, that you mentioned earlier, is that what you would put in a category of, of business that was, has been left undone or something that, that is 
now been out there on the horizon that would that would need to be reintroduced. Again, when we refer to that record and, and we look at what's been done or, or what are the goals for potentially a second term, where does that fall? In that? Yeah, it's something that's been largely left undone. We've made some small changes, uh, but really everything has been very strategic over the last two years. There have been, okay, you know, in this given month we're going to take up this project and trying to keep people pulling in a, in a similar direction. And road funding has been, for the last year, it's been laid out there as fall 2012. Uh, so we're, we're to that point now. We've started to explore some options. Uh, just recently, um, a uh, commission was appointed. It'll serve as a task force of uh, House members and Senate members that will really dig in deep into these proposals, make some recommendations, and then we'll move forward. But I'm hopeful that we get it done this fall. Uh, I know the governor said recently that um, due to the extent that we're underfunding roads right now and not doing the preventative maintenance that needs to be done, that we have somewhere in excess of a million dollars each day that is evaporating like water on a hot sidewalk. It is evaporating the value out of our roads. And so it, it's important that we act now because the, the preventative maintenance can be done at a much lower cost per mile than the extreme maintenance where we're actually grinding and repaving roads. So it's important that we, uh, you know, it's like the old uh, oil change commercials, pay me now or pay me later. Uh, certainly the oil change is much less expensive than the engine overhaul. If we look at then what what you have mentioned, and you mentioned the, the the little bit of a different configuration of the map, how closely does this mirror what people have been telling you on the campaign trail? And with the addition and and somewhat a different layout, a little bit to that the map for District 99, issues that the voters have said to you as a candidate for this office that they want to see uh, addressed in terms of how you take that on again legislatively and, and in the role in Lansing. I'd say road funding is a big one, uh, and I've been talking about that as I go across the district and letting people know over the last year that we will be taking it up this fall because I've been asking for input on it and saying that, um, you know, I see this as being a, a big task because we know that more funding is needed, and so where's that funding going to come from? So road funding has been a big one. Uh, another one that's a frequent discussion is the cost of corrections. Uh, in this state, we spend over $2 billion a year uh, to house prisoners, and that's money that um, many people in the district uh, will bring up and they'll say, you know, we could use that money elsewhere. And so I've really dug deep into that corrections budget, uh, toured a prison recently, really to learn more about corrections. Uh, what is good corrections? How do we rehabilitate people as opposed to housing people? Uh, so corrections has been a big one because it is such a big area of spending. Uh, certainly education has been another big one. And I serve on the Higher Education Committee as well as the Community Colleges Committee. How can we keep tuition low? That was another big success uh, over the last two years is in higher education we've had a period of years where the tuition increases have been fairly more than significant. Uh, and one thing that we did within the Higher Ed Committee was to put in tuition restraint language. This is language that would limit the amount that a, uh, well, it didn't limit it, but it, it gave an incentive to the universities to keep their tuition increases low. And actually, Central Michigan University, which is right here in our district, uh, this past year had the lowest tuition increase of all public 15 universities at 1.96%. So I felt really good about that, uh, that we, we really did have an effect there. Uh, it was an effort to try to keep our schools accessible uh, to the people of Michigan. That is then, then something that, that plays out at this point when we look at then K-12 schools and also corrections that you mentioned, uh, issues that you would point to there uh, that have been addressed uh, or <laughs> sort of the choice A has been addressed or is the business left undone or something that specifically is coming up as more of a new targeted issue if elected to a second term. As far as education? Education first and correction second, yes. Sure. Uh, with education, I think we've made, for our district in particular, uh, a good step forward this last year. What I mean by that, 2011 was, was a difficult year. There were some cuts made uh, to education, and certainly nobody wants to cut education. But as you look at the state budget, you look at that billion and a half dollar deficit that I talked about, it's, you really can't avoid areas such as correction, such as education, without some of the cuts because they're such a big part of that budget. But one thing that I uh, worked hard toward uh, this past year was coming off 2011, which was very difficult, we had that surplus money that I mentioned. And we were able to get $90 million of that surplus back into education. And there was a group of us really from my district, and, and uh, most of them would be north from here, that have school districts that we represent that receive the bottom of the foundational allowance. Because there's such a, still a staggering difference in how we fund our schools. You have the bottom that it get about $6,800 per student, and at the top, it's, it's closer to 10000 per student. And people think that Proposal A fixed all that. Well, it really didn't. There's still this 
staggering gap. And so what we fought for was to say, hey, rather than taking this peanut butter approach with this $90 million and spreading it evenly across all the districts, we got to pump that $90 million into the bottom. And we were able to do that. And so every district that I represent received uh, an additional $120. The, the floor was raised $120 per student. We did have a couple districts that were $60 off the bottom, so they received $60. Uh, but the bulk of them received an extra or $120 per student, and so that's a step forward. I want to continue to work to get more money into education, but to get it into the bottom, to bring that bottom up. Does that up. point to a, a potential scrapping of, restructuring of, or, or some adjustment to Proposal A as a whole, or coming up with a potentially new formula? Is that something that would potentially be a goal in a coming term? That's actually being explored right now, is looking at the way that uh, schools are funded, and actually the governor has appointed a group uh, that's doing uh, kind of the, the preparatory work to have that conversation. Uh, so we'll get there at some point, maybe after the first of the year, and start to explore uh, you know, that group's findings. Uh, but in the short term, my effort is certainly to bring that money into the bottom so that we're raising it. You know, I say, as you look across the state, the students that I represent here in Isabel and Midland counties are worth every bit as much as students in the uh, areas such as, um, you know, you look at Bloomfield is one that's often cited or, um, you know, some of the areas that receive that top end of the foundational allowance. Certainly they have issues of, you know, higher cost of living and things of that nature, but we have to work to bring this bottom up. And briefly then back to the corrections front, again, would you mentioned it as something you want to be taking a look at then is is that a further look or something that you pointed to business undone or or something that you see then clearly as an issue you want to address if reelected certainly an issue that I want to continue to readdress we've made uh, some inroads in the way of efficiency but right now it cost about thirty four thousand dollars per year to house a prisoner and so what we're looking at is potentially spending more money in the short term to gain in the long term. And that really brings these two areas together. We talk about education and we talk about corrections. What can we do on the front end of education to hopefully realize the savings in the correction side? And one thing that's being talked about is early childhood education. Not starting just at kindergarten, but how do we start even earlier to get kids on the, the right path so that they have a greater chance of completing uh, their high school education and hopefully pursuing something further whether it be a trade trade school or higher education but how can we invest money strategically so that we'll realize long term that benefit and that takes a lot of um, that takes a lot of drive and a lot of uh, uh, will on the part of legislators who are often you know seeking the short term fix just to help them out in the way of reelection so how do we make the disciplined approach to say we're going to reinvest on the short end uh, in the short term to realize that long term savings in our last 30 seconds then to sum up in general from all the things that we've had a chance to uh, talk about what's the last message you want to leave with the voters that you are seeking your vote sure my last message is is um, you know the record that I have had it has included some very difficult decisions uh, I stand behind all of those decisions while they were difficult uh, they were decisions that need to be made to put Michigan on a good path uh, financially uh, so that when we uh, pass the, the keys to the state to our children and grandchildren, they'll be on a much more solid footing. We've made some serious inroads. I feel we still have a long way to go and uh, look forward to talking to voters throughout the district to be able to explain those votes further. Well, we appreciate your time today and, and a discussion on all these and good luck with the rest of the campaign. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. Thank you, as always, for your time and attention as well. This has been uh, Meet the Candidates. We've been talking with uh, Representative Kevin Cotter, Republican from Michigan's 99th State House District. He is seeking re-election to a second term in that office. This and all of our segments being posted to our website. You can find that at WCMU.org. And for all of us here, we do encourage you to get out and use your right to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you for joining us for Meet the Candidates. CMU Public Broadcasting invited both major party candidates for this office to participate in this series. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas. We are joined this time by Adam Lawrence. He is the Democratic candidate for Michigan's 99th State House District. Adam, thanks for taking the time to join us and welcome. No problem. Thank you for having me. The program we uh, call Meet the Candidates gives incumbents a chance to reintroduce, challengers a chance to get acquainted with the voters. So we ask you the uh, chance then to uh, take the first few moments, give us a little bit of an idea about your background and experience that you bring to the campaign. Certainly. Uh, I grew up in Coleman, Michigan, small town in rural Midland County. And uh, I'm a Central Michigan alumnus. I proudly studied history and political science while I attended, coming out of high school, or coming out of college, excuse me. I uh, was organizing for We Are the People of Michigan, just working on this uh, collective bargaining proposal too, right when it was getting off the ground. 
Uh, a little bit later on in my collegiate career, uh, I decided that I was going to challenge Mr. Cotter for this local house seat. And I think that it is important that we have the leadership that we need down in Lansing that re really represents and really reflects this district more so than uh, most candidates can. So what I think is important in this election is that as far as the platform goes, that we make sure that we fund education, create good jobs, and take care of the seniors who have already paid into their entitlements. We mentioned uh, where you are from, that part of this uh, 99th district. Give us an idea about the rest of the map, the counties, townships, and so forth that are all contained in District 99. Sure. District 99 includes every township in Isabella County, 16, and now it includes 10 out of Midland County. It used to have 12, but there's been a redistricting after the 2010 election, and uh, now it's, uh, our Democratic base has went up about 3% uh, just in the district. We lost some of the townships like Lee, Homer Township, and we picked up uh, the townships of Ingersoll and Mount Haley. They're a little bit south of Midland, more so in the Bullet Creek School District area. Now you mentioned, uh, or at least began to touch on this some, but, but this is the point where we, we get into the main part of the discussion, looking at, well, as you have been campaigning, what the voters are telling you and what you as a candidate are identifying as the prime issues going into this campaign of 2012. Certainly. I've knocked about a I've knocked thousands of doors this election, and the number one thing that people are concerned about and have a problem with when I'm talking to folks at their home is health care. It seems to be a real issue. It seems to be a real issue in this district. Uh, a lot of folks also are telling me right now uh, unemployment is very hard to get. Uh, uh, disability is very hard to attain for these folks who really need it. And I think these are the concerns, especially in a lot of the rural places in this district. Uh, we live in a relatively low-income area. The average uh, Isabella County resident makes $12,000 a year less than the average Michigan resident. And I think it really reflects when you take a look at the unemployment rate and how much lower it is than the average Michigan unemployment rate in Isabella County. It's lower. What that means is that folks in Isabella County are willing to work. So I think what the biggest problem is with the health care and uh, Social Security and unemployment is these benefits and these jobs that these folks are working aren't giving them the benefits that they need to sustain their life. And I think that a lot of people are concerned. How specifically then as a challenger in this race would you go about uh, focusing on those? What would be some of the initiatives that you would want to put into play uh, right out of the blocks should you win election and, and take office in January? I think the most important thing is that we have funding to do these things. So we need to create tax revenue right out of the gate. And uh, history proves that the fastest way to create tax revenue is by strengthening the middle class. And the way you strengthen the middle class fastest is by eliminating poverty. And you start at the bottom and you try to bring it up instead of that trickle-down approach. So the first thing I would do is make several investments in higher and primary education. And I can almost promise you that within a year that it will yield significant amount of tax revenue and give us a little bit of freedom to secure up our Medicaid, our Medicare, and our Social Security, and invest in unemployment and EBT benefits for folks who really need them. And to get that type of investment, uh, what would be the approach? We are bound by the constitutional amendment for the balanced budget, so would this be uh, raising the revenue or looking at uh, shifting some of uh, the other tax support or, or funding that's gone to other areas of the budget? What would be the approach you would choose? Well, certainly, I think we need to definitely alleviate some of the taxes for lower and middle class families. And in doing that, we're going to have to ask the folks who make you know, $2 million a year to pay a little bit more. And after they pay a little bit more for a year or two, I'm, I, once again, I think these investments in education, in Social Security, that they're going to yield profitability and it's going to free up a lot of uh, state funding for us to make better decisions with our money. You mentioned education too, and, and then we'll get to that a little bit more specifically in a moment. But if we look at the unemployment rate here versus uh, statewide, are, are there particular areas where you see in terms of a diversified economy or just the overall uh, lack of jobs or what, what is the specific concern that you have in terms of this area as a part of the state when it comes to uh, the types of jobs that we have, the level of unemployment that is uh, presently on the books and, and how we would go about improving that? Sure. I, well, I would like to first say that you know, a lot of the jobs that are being created in Michigan are manufacturing jobs. Right now, the economy is doing much better than it has in the past. And I think a lot of that is due in part to the auto bailout. In fact, 15,000 jobs were created last year alone in the auto industry, and 26,500 jobs were created in the manufacturing industry. So I would like to see some of the manufacturing come to Isabella County. Maybe I don't know if we need to do it through infrastructure investments, but we need to build things that will lay a foundation for good-paying jobs instead of low-paying jobs. And 
David, that's where I think the problem really is, is these jobs out here are low-paying jobs, and they're often depicting people as working poor citizens when they're out there putting in 40, 50 hours a week. And when you can't get benefits, you have to pick up a second job, usually, to pay your bills. And I think that, you know, if we could look at making an investment to get some more infrastructure here, I don't know if it would be just rather, you know, it would be through a recycling center or a manufacturing plant, but we need to bring something here that is going to be stable, good-paying jobs for the future. Infrastructure within the, the local or regional economy of this district, or uh, is there anything in, in terms of the overall regulatory nature of how business gets attracted to wanting to do business in Michigan or specific parts of Michigan? What can District 99 do? What would you propose to do to make this a more business friendly and, and attract that uh, type of business that you're talking about? Definitely. I think that right now Mount Pleasant is an attractive place for people to come. We have great parks. We have great uh, uh, community programs for people right now that they can go and be a part of anytime they need to. So one thing I would like to see, and Union Township has taken a leadership role in doing this, is I think we can make it a much friendlier family place. And I think we can make it a friendlier place for tourism. And the way that we go about that, first of all, on a family level, is I think we need to make sure that there are paved sidewalks on all of our streets. We need to make sure that our parks are kept up and that they look good and that, that transportation through these parks is accessible. I also believe that right now there's this idea, they're building stations all over Mount Pleasant and they're building these bike repair stations to encourage people to exercise and get out and be active in their community. And uh, at these little stations you can repair a tire, you can get air, and you can uh, rehydrate yourself for free. And I think those are things that really make this place much more attractive. Um, also, we have a great university here. As far as tourism goes, I know a lot of folks that come up to District 99 and spend money in our economy are staying at our hotels. They're here for our football teams. They're here for our sports teams. They're here for their kids when they come from out of town. And I think that we need to make investments in our school. I think if we give the funding to Central Michigan University, that they'll do pretty good things with it. And I think they have a pretty good record of bringing people to this district. And I think that making college affordable will bring more people to this district. Last year, Central Michigan University had a 12% decrease in enrollment in one year. And I think a lot of that is due in part to the rising cost of tuition and the unaffordability of being able to live as an independent individual. So those are a couple things I'd like to see done. I would like to see this place much more uh, family friendly, and I would like to see mid-Michigan much more tourist attractive. And you talked too about the investment in the, in the K-12 education as being a top priority. Several of the guests that have come here, candidates for uh, the various districts, have talked about uh, the disparity in funding, the question of whether or not Proposal A is still a viable option as a funding model. And there have been different approaches as to what level of either changing it out all right or, or, or how we go about revising that, that model to provide a more stable and uh, sustainable source of funding for the schools. What is your view there? I think that the 15% uh, state budget cut to public universities and secondary education when Snyder came in needs to be uh, addressed. And I think it starts with leadership. I think it takes uh, certain kind of leaders to get down to Lansing and let people understand when you're pitting a corrections budget against an education budget, of course nobody can win. So I think the first thing we need to do is restore that 15% funding so it's not coming out of individuals' pockets. I think it's very important for the community. It's important for Central Michigan to have that funding. Even when they're making plans for future ideas, future investment, it's important that they have a foundation of what they have for resources so they can do the most that they can. So I think having that money and knowing what you're going to have before you start would be a significant advantage. Another issue that has come up in, in some of these discussions too, depending on the, the layout of the district, and 99 certainly reflects this to a degree, is uh, the issue of agriculture. There are more rural parts to the district outside of city of Mount Pleasant and home to CMU and, and the like. Uh, what are voters telling you? What are you seeing as the primary issues there? Sure. I, a lot of voters right now are telling me that, uh, for example, Senator Stabenow has taken a pioneer activist role in making sure that agriculturists are being able to provide a service that's good, that, that they can sell their products to lo at local farmers markets and make sure that people can get fresh food and good food. And I think it's important. I think a lot of uh, farmers have said to me, you know, with all this gen genetically modified food being available at large retail stores like Walmart, it's easy for folks to always take the cheaper option. But uh, we launched early in this campaign this idea for a buy local, buy Michigan back, buy America back plan. And we really put an emphasis on buying from your neighbor and buying from that uh, farmer's market next door, from your local butcher. Not only is it 
uh, helping your local economy, what it's, it's healthier, it's, you know, it's, it's much more fundamentally makes sense as an investment in the community to support the businesses locally. So that's something that we've did and put an emphasis on. And I think that uh, farmers really appreciated that. And uh, we'll be looking forward to working with some of the farmers in the area to make sure that they get the help they need in the places they need it. So from an infrastructure point of view, it, it is, there would be improvements that could be made for how we market and do agriculture along with other types of jobs if, if the area is seen as more receptive and friendly to, again, the idea of doing business here. Certainly. I think it's important. We need to just make this place an attractive place and a, a bevy that people want to come to and uh, really make it a community that it has the potential to be. We have a lot of great resources here, not just Central Michigan University. We have Mid-Michigan Community College. We have the Soaring Eagle Casino and Resort. It supplies a lot of college kids' jobs so they can get through school. And we need to, just, we need to invest in those, uh, those things that we have to make sure that this place can stabilize itself and be a great place for people to come. From that list then of, of issues and concerns that you have seen as a candidate that voters are telling you, if you were to take the last 30 seconds that we have, sum that all up into the message you would want to leave with the voters, why you are specifically asking for their vote for this office, what would that message be? Sure. My economic approach is fundamentally different from the uh, young man who holds office right now. His approach is, is that we give tax breaks to those who are very wealthy and that the money and the economic wealth will trickle down to the middle and lower classes. What I believe, that, and I hope this is what the election is about, what this election is about is what kind of economic theory our voters want for the next two years. What I believe is that we need to invest in our resources, invest in our school, invest in our unemployed and the people who need the help, and ultimately rebuild this economy from the bottom up and not, not, not the other way around. Well, we appreciate your time and attention to address all those, to talk specifically to the voters, and we wish you best of luck with the rest of the campaign. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us as well here once again on Meet the Candidates. We've been joined by Adam Lawrence, a Democratic candidate for Michigan's 99th State House District. This and all of our interviews are being posted on our website at wcmu.org. And, of course, then also we, as uh, our collective here, are urging all of you to get out and exercise your right to vote on Tuesday, November 6th. This has been Meet the Candidates, a production of CMU Public Broadcasting. Both major party candidates were invited to participate in this series. For a complete listing of the air dates and times for this series, or to watch or listen to this program again, go to our website, wcmu.org. Support of WCMU is provided by Flint Institute of Arts, presenting Drawing Together International Cartoons. The exhibition features 300 cartoons from the Iden Doan Foundation International Competition and runs through December 30th. FlintArts.org.